Okay, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It's uh, 1030 on my watch and AV's good, right? Okay. Uh, well, hello, my name is Brian Kelly. I've been programming Perl professionally for, for about 20 years. My organization runs some very old Perls, uh, some older than, than my career. Uh, I like to call them ancient Perls because uh, software from just a few years ago can seem like it's ancient. Also, it makes my managers a little uncomfortable to call it that. The point of this talk is to discuss some strategies for safe, maintainable, sustainable Perl development, even if you're running an ancient Perl. You can write better code even if your Perl is ancient. Just because your Perl is from the 90s doesn't mean you have to develop software like it's the 90s. Um, so what is an ancient Perl? Things really changed with the development of Perl around the time of 510, which, was, which is 2007. Uh, we got into a regular release cadence and we started to really innovate the language that hadn't changed a whole lot. It kind of been bug fix a little bit, um, uh, except for Unicode. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, but 2007 in technology time is a long time ago. Uh, so, uh, so even that I think is, is a bit ancient. Um, if you can be using a more recent version than 5.10, it's probably a good move. Uh, but, but sometimes you can't. Um, as we all know, Perl is still deeply embedded in lots of systems, even though it's not high profile in most cases. If you've ever had to debug some of this really ancient code, which may have actually been written in the 90s, uh, you'll know that some of these old approaches can make things really fragile and really dangerous to change. Upgrading a recent Perl, upgrading to a recent Perl might be a big undertaking, but making some small improvements might be a lot easier. and You can still get some very good results. A uh, caveat? I'm really only talking about Perl 5. We're not going back to Perl 4 and 3 and, and whatnot. Uh, I mean, admittedly, also ancient. Um, but that still takes us back to the mid-90s, uh, which I hope we can all agree is pretty ancient. Uh, you might be able to apply some of these approach approaches to earlier Perls, but no objects, no references, no modules, or like kind of odd ways to go about doing those things. It's just kind of, we, we could really go down that rabbit hole and, this is a 20 minute talk. Um, we're talking uh, cultural anthropology here, not archeology. span so. so why are people using ancient pearls? Um, maybe you're using some old proprietary compiled library. That's, that's my main reason. Or maybe you have an emotional attachment to an old version. Or maybe uh, your version is proven and validating some new version sounds like a lot of work. Or maybe it's just that management doesn't want to support that work to upgrade. That's also my reason. Uh, these can all be good reasons, or maybe they're bad reasons. I'm not here to discuss why or justify anything or, or even talk about how to upgrade. All that's beyond the scope of our discussion. The fact is, you sometimes use an ancient Perl. We're going to talk about some strategies for improving the quality of that code. Uh, and we're mostly talking about syntax stuff here. So we're not talking about integrating with external services, whether that's databases or web stuff or, or whichever. We're kind of like going into, you know, the particular characters you're typing. Um, first, let's talk about lexical file handles. Before Perl 5.8, we could only use bare word file handles. And I think you'll even find code that's written for more recent Perls that are still using bare word file handles. Uh, the problem with bare word file handles is that they're package level. If you use the same file name, a file handle name somewhere, it's really the same file handle. It's not exactly global, but it's still trouble. So if your file handle, uh, so if you name your file handle as creatively as I have done here, but no one does that, right? Uh, you can easily run into trouble when someone else is just as creative as you are when naming their file handles. Uh, making a file handle lexical makes it so it's scoped to just the current block, um, just like any other variable you create with my. That's because it is a variable that you create with my. A lexically scoped file handle can't accidentally be accessed somewhere else in the program. You can, of course, make the file handle available somewhere else, but you have to do that explicitly. And I think we'd all agree that that's a good thing. Um, what we'd like to do, this is what we'd like to do, uh, but again, this is ancient Perl, so three argument open is out, a real lexical variable is out, so what can we do? Uh, we can use the symbol module, which gives us the gen sim function. Symbol has been in the standard library since at least 5.2. Um, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe it was even around before then. Uh, this function returns a reference to an anonymous glob, 
which is a little hard to explain, so I won't, but it's this easy to use. Uh, also, even with a lexical file handle, try to be more descriptive with your variable names than this, please. It's a few extra lines of code, but you get a real lexical file handle. The safety and sanity of lexical file handles are worth the extra use line and call it a gensim. It works on directory handles too. So instead of unsafe global file handles, make your ancient Perl file handles lexical. Come debugging time, you'll be glad you did. Uh, the state keyword was introduced in Perl 5.10. It tells Perl to preserve a variable's value across uh, entries into that lexical block to keep its state persistent. Um, this can be used to save reinitializing something complicated like a database connection maybe, um, or to just keep track of how many times you've called a subroutine. Uh, you can even use it for object-ish get and set routines, stuff like that. There, there are a lot of cool uses for it. Um, if you want something like this functionality prior to 5.10, you can instead define a new lexical scope outside of a subroutine with, with this extra set of curly braces. Uh, any variables declared inside that outer scope, um, outside the subroutine, but within the, that extra set of curly braces, uh, will have persistent state across calls to the subroutines within that lexical scope. Um, I personally use this approach maybe a bit too much. I reach for this approach when refactoring uh, a library into an, like an almost object-y model, um, but, but like, when bringing on a full object-oriented framework it might seem like too much of a change. Um, like anything, it could be overused, but that doesn't mean you should never use it. Um, it can be awfully handy. Uh, named regex capture groups were introduced in Perl 5.10 also. There's a lot of stuff in 5.10. They're a great way to make your regexes more readable and extendable. In older versions of Perl, you only get the numbered regex variables, $1, etc. But in 5.10 and later, you can use the cool plus hash to access captures by their names. Uh, since the captured values come out of a regex in list context, if, if you write it that way, uh, you can dump the matches into any list-ish list -ish structure, like an array. Using the magic of L value hash slices, uh, you can recreate some of the advantages of name captures in ancient Perl. There probably isn't a good way to hack this to use these hash slice captures in a substitution regex. There are, there are limits to our work here today. Lexical subroutines were introduced in 518 and are no longer experimental as of 526, which I mean, 526 is six, eight years ago or something, so that's even a while ago. You can do some interesting things with confining a subroutine to the current lexical scope. Some object D, some data integrity stuff. Look it up, they can be awfully handy, and so it's a nice tool to have access to. Even in ancient Perl, we can declare a subroutine reference. And since that's just a variety of a scalar, it's lexical already, uh, or as long as you called it with my. Um, since it's a scalar, it's not accessible from outside your module at all. Unless you export it, of course, but don't do that. If you want to export it, then just use a regular module or a regular subroutine and export it. Um, this doesn't get you the handy namespace overwriting of real lexical subroutines, but this approach can still be pretty powerful. Uh, private subroutines, internal initializers, the list goes on, or at least there, there is something about the list. So two items. Uh, subroutine signatures. I was digging at this one for a little bit. There isn't a really, a really great way, feature equivalent way to recreate subroutine signatures, um, at least that I could figure out, but there are some good approaches you can and should take when unpacking your subroutine arguments. Uh, first up, just count your arguments for sanity's sake. Uh, I wouldn't just die here, this is just simple. You should probably raise a useful message depending on what your subroutine is up to or whatever. Um, you should also consider having your subroutine take in a hash as an argument. You see a lot of advice around this. I think uh, this is one thing that Damien suggests. Um, it definitely makes calls to your subroutine easier to read, even if there's a bit of boilerplate in the subroutine itself. Um, uh, you might be surprised by how much you can make use of CPAN, even on these really ancient pearls. You will, of course, have more luck with pure Perl modules. A nice thing with integrating CPAN modules into your ancient Perl stack is that when or if you finally do an upgrade, you can probably leave the modules and their usage 
uh, when you get around to otherwise modernizing your code. Using a try module, there are, there are many, not, not just try harder, um, can, be hand, can be a handy and safe alternative to using eval for the same purpose. Try harder is an easy to use pure Perl example, but, but there are others. Um, if you can't do a three argument open in your, uh, in your Perl, there are some options on CPAN. Both open two and open three in the IPC namespace are worth investigating. Even when you do have a three argument open, they bring a lot to the table. Testing modules like test too sweet, test simple, test more can be a great addition to your workflow, even on an ancient Perl. These modules will work fine, but they're probably not, but they're probably not part of your site, though, depending on your particular distribution and version. Getting into test driven development is beyond the scale of this talk, but don't dismiss the idea just because you're using an ancient Perl. Um, tell me if you've heard this one before. Integrating critic and tidy are what really got me onto modernizing my team's code base. Our, our keynote speaker, uh, Ruth Holloway, did a great talk at YABC NA 2016 in Orlando called Everyone's a Critic uh, on why you should use Perl Critic. Her talk is on YouTube, so I'll let her convince you rather than just repeating her points. I was at that talk and found her pretty convincing. Um, if you're not familiar, these are both tools that you run on your code to help improve your code quality a lot. Perl Critic is a static analysis tool that points out things you might want to change. Perl Tidy is a code beautifier that formats your code consistently. Using both of these tools will not only get your team on the same page, but will also make maintaining older code a lot easier. Remember, neither is draconian. They're both wildly configurable. Configure them to your tastes and needs. Extra credit for executing both in a commit time GitHub. Uh, I hope you found some approaches that you can take back to your own Perl code bases. Uh, hit me up in the hallway track if you want to discuss ancient pearl or whatever else. Um, thank you very much. Um, any questions or, or anything? We got, we got a little bit. I, on the last slide, very, very briefly. Yeah, um, that, that's one thing I do on my team. Um, we, we publish out uh, a commit hook uh, that, that runs critic and tidy and we also have a naming convention for .t files, and they got to run too. It's everyone's local hook. It's a commit hook, so so it can be a little trouble because like, oh, you didn't install the hook, and what the the way we end up controlling for that is we've got a code review script too that then kind of does the same thing. You've got to pass code review. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you still need to put a hook in there, but it's like a little stub. Good, good thinking. Yeah, where I've run into that, of course, because like we add some new feature to the hook. It's like, everyone, make sure to update your. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right on. Good, good, good thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, no, I haven't done that. Uh, the, the question was uh, installing uh, CPAN modules on some ancient distribution. You know, sometimes it'll just say, you've got to use 510 or, or, or something, even though maybe you don't really need to use 510. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if, if you go that route, you probably want to go back to the maintainer and say, hey, I got this going on 5.5, just FYI. Um, so, the, you know, help, help the rest of us using ancient pearls. Um, yeah, I've had on the really ancient stuff, I happen to be, uh, my work is on a Windows environment. We use an active state distribution, one of the ones that doesn't have a compiler. Um, so, so going with uh, Pure Perl has worked a lot better for us. Um, but, uh, but also active state maintained the PPM, the Perl package manager. And so, but then our firewall is terrible. And so we had to like manually dive through that, but eh, got there eventually. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's, that's been a pain. So something that's just simple and pure Perl off of CPAN, it's just uh, miles easier in, in my environment at least. All right, well, thank you everyone. And uh, 
I'll give you a little bit of time back. 